Hi, this is Levi Armandelli, and this is the audio commentary for the Artisan Wraith issue 5. Now the cover here is the Wraith Triumvirate, and I wanted just kind of a classic shot of them looking good and imposing with the fleet in the background. This was an image that I finished, or knew was going to be a cover early on into making this series. I knew I wanted to kind of circulate this image as just a signature shot of the kind of army in, in full. This is a big issue, um, what goes down in it and the cliffhanger. Um, it really is meant to kind of be a lot of momentum into the finale of this series. Uh, we'll get to what they actually discover, but the beginning here is the Legion on the way to the homeworld, where I wanted the scene of Legion Viscount and Legion Envoy talking and basically sharing their concerns about the direction that things are heading and potentially questioning the leadership of the Zenith. You know, is he being blinded by his affection for the Wraith. And, you know, I wanted there to be a bit of mystery about why they're so uneasy about going to the home world. And then we saw at the end of the last issue, the Wraith also, in sort of the dreamscape environment, he also is very not in favor of going to the home world the way that they're going. And we will see why in this issue and leading into the next. The design of the Wraith bridge here on this next page and the one after, I. I wanted it to always be very kind of crude, like everything is sort of rocky and there's no comfort and the workstations are just kind of like these stone kind of almost pools where there's this molten light that rises up and that's basically how they fly their ships. The ships themselves have the same sort of three slits of eyes that the entire Wraith army has, you know, this kind of variation. And I, I liked that, the design for a bridge where you'd have three levels to kind of look out from. I thought it was an interesting hopefully interesting kind of different different view of a traditional bridge where even though they are a very powerful and sort of high-tech army in a spaceship their bridge is very crude it almost looks like cavemen created it you know like it, it just looks it looks very old and ancient that's what i wanted from their from their race especially given where they're heading to which is the home world and sort of the most advanced part of their civilization i wanted the artisan wraith to show up here and i like the kind of funniness that they're forced to sort of endure him and then the artisan has no interest in toning down his personality whatsoever that he sort of has offered something that legion zenith went along with which is you know let's go kill the foragers they've been horrible to all of us they're responsible for a lot of our misery collectively but i also wanted it to be clear that legion zenith really does run the show here you know and i wanted this next sequence here where we return to the resolve and the lurk and the axial to justify why they're on board. And to me, it made a lot of sense. It was like, well, if the Legion knows one thing, it's like these three are not aligned with the Artisan Wraith. And they're also sort of emissaries of the home world and the Forgers that it would seem important to me to bring them along. And then I wanted the mystery of why the bodies of the characters from the first series are also on board, where you can kind of guess where this is heading in this issue. This next big sequence here, the big reveal of the home world destroyed I liked doing that because kind of like in the first series, how I felt that, you know, city planets, we've seen so many of them and done so well. I mean, Coruscant and Los Angeles and Blade Runner, they look phenomenal. And that's just on top of the billions of amazing science fiction city paintings that exist out there. I didn't really want to have the city kind of intact. I thought it was much more interesting to show it destroyed when they arrive and to have the mystery of, of what happened. And again, it has the same architecture as the little bits of it we saw in the first series where even though it's a sci-fi city, it's sort of, there's a lot of water around it and kind of more Sydney Opera House round shapes to it. This next page of the bodies we see, we see dead artisans and we see dead axials, which we've never seen before because it's a very, these are kind of the most elite of the classes. So to actually see tons of their dead bodies is unusual. We've seen kind of labor class mass graves and that kind of thing but this is really kind of unheard of this level of devastation would come to the home world itself and i wanted this moment of the axial with her hand against the glass to kind of show that her she's sort of horrified by what she's seeing because she has not been on the home world in quite a while and i i wanted there to be a kind of a collective mystery to all this where now finally every character is sort of unified where the artist and wraith also doesn't know what's happened so Everyone is sort of wondering. And then Legion Zenith 
who is in command orders Legion Envoy to the ground and Legion Viscount to the skies. And that's, they're going to basically comb the entire planet. I liked the doing a mystery of uh, sur- surveying an entire planet of what was going down. And that's something with, I think a robot army lends itself to that you have the numbers, you have the speed, and then you can kind of survive those conditions. I thought it was kind of an interesting idea. This little sequence where Legion Viscount is reading the ship, I, I like the notion that he can manipulate things with his hand and then the energy. That's how you fly the ships. That's how you get information. And the artisan picks up on how you operate the ships, which is an important thing for later in the series. As always, the artisan's kind of asshole personality. He cannot. He simply cannot help himself. But it sort of disguises and contrasts how smart he actually is. And you know him discovering how their ships work and just how quickly he can piece that together. I thought, I want to keep that aspect of his personality going. Uh, this next week in se- sequence here with the uh, Artisan Wraith and the Legion Zenith on in the home world, where I wanted the Artisan Wraith again to kind of make a really convincing argument, which is like, hey, I just wanted them gone. I don't care where they went. I don't care what happened to them. But, you know, we can remake the home world now. Like, we can we can all have a happier life. And, you know, his tone finally crosses the line and uh, Legion Zenith lifts him up. And that is meant to show that he is much physically stronger than the Wraith's body. So that's something for the future of this series as well. Um, the page after this with the resolve and the lurk, because their job is always to kind of survey information and to break targets. I wanted them to be the ones picking up on the uneasiness of this and that there's something wrong. You know, that especially the lurk kind of seeing just uh, Legion Zenith looking out to the horizon, that something really has his attention. I wanted that to be an ominous beat. And so they task themselves with kind of trying to solve it. So the Lurk cloaks and goes off. And the Resolve is going to go into basically this advanced weaponry building that Artisans designed all this really top secret stuff. So she's basically going to steal it, which is something that I thought was appealing. If you were kind of a professional assassin and you suddenly had access to the most dangerous weapons in the world, that would be a very appealing thing. And this next sequence between the Artisan Wraith and the Axial, I want to include that the artisan really does, for all of his you know, terrible personality and how he treats people horribly, he really does respect the Axial because he respects in- intelligence and intellect. And so she is sort of you know, along his level of they are the two smartest people on the planet now. So he's enlisting her, one, to actually return everyone back to their bodies from the first series, which I, it was important to me that the characters from the first series come back, you know, not just in a dreamscape. I really wanted to physically see them again. And hopefully it's it's kind of nice. I remember when I was drawing these pages, I was like, because I was you know months and months into working on this series before they show up in their own bodies, and I was I was kind of moved by it a little bit. I was like, oh yeah, these characters, like even for me, I was like, this kind of it's kind of nice to see them again. It was a nice a nice feeling. And I of course wanted him to still be, you know, a little bit calculating or a lot calculating of, you know, just because I'm giving you you know my chip, you know, you're not like this. The, the Killock will protect me, you know. Um, we go into this next sequence. This was a, sec- a page I added later, but I like I like the ominousness of it a lot. Where, you know, I wanted something creepy, truly creepy, of you know Legion Envoy on the ground and Legion Viscount kind of hologramming in that they find something out there, which is sort of a scarecrow-ish sculpture of dead robot parts that something is made. And I wanted I wanted it to hopefully be if you know these two are uncomfortable given all that they're capable of doing and all they fought, that that's kind of like what the Wraith says in the first series, which is directly tied to this, which is like, you know, we've seen things out in the galaxy that made us go cold with fear. So if they're afraid of something, I wanted it to be suitably disturbing. And then there's this further alliance between Envoy and Viscount of, in the event that something must be done about Legion Zenith, where basically the entire fleet, the army, has almost sort of been trained by them at this point. The Legion Zenith is so old that Envoy and Viscount are kind of running things. And I wanted, I tried to feel like, what is a human signature of being an alliance that's not a handshake and not a fist bump? And I thought two forearms coming together, that felt like an old warrior kind of way of showing visually without saying anything that we are, we are united. This was an important page, this next one for the Axial, her watching the sentencing chamber. So this is the building that in the first series you saw the flashbacks of everyone being sentenced. This is that building. And so I wanted her to kind of have this moment of sitting quietly and watching it collapse. And most people, as she says, like would hate, you know, to see their own legacy destroyed. But for her, 
it's sort of a visual end to something that she started that she has a lot of a lot of guilt about this whole page is dedicated to her we see her in surgery now removing the artisan's chip and then this next page is the return of the kid and i wanted him to have a very kid-like reaction that you know his because he his body took so much damage that his arm needed to be replaced so now he has two arms that are actually the same color and so he's really happy about that and then i wanted to contrast that by the labor looking at his his replaced legs now that i knew i wanted the labor to come back and have yet another sort of like awful thing happened to him that that's just sort of the way his life goes is that there's always something bad happening and I wanted his legs to look to look ridiculous and yet be stronger than his first leg so it made sense why she would why she would attach them uh, this moment where she basically offers to seal up the artisan's chip forever and the laborer says that it's not his call to make I wanted that in there to kind of show that on some level the laborer does not like but respect the artisan for just some basic ability that he did keep them safe you know true to his word from the first series they did they did make it safely and now even though they're still linked together they're under the protection of this army he returned them to their bodies so he basically chooses to also allow the artisan to return to his body as well and of course this scene of the laborer trying to get the kid to say hello to the axial that's a very human thing you know if you are around a kid or you see a kid meet someone he, he or she doesn't know they're often really shy and i wanted that to kind of come across i also wanted a little bit of the the laborer's temper a hint of that here where he's more firm with the kid and then i wanted uh the kid always is sort of from the first series too he's, his mind is sort of never really on the current moment of what's happening so when the axle is telling him about why his wiring is exposed he's just asking where the wraith is which leads to this next page i wanted this like touching hopefully touching shot of the wraith being welcomed back to his people and you know he's a a grunt like the other ones he's not part of the triumvirate so he would be really welcomed by the other members of his of his race who knew him and remembered him and i wanted this them all touching him and then seeing the contrast too of the color in his frame and what and then theirs being different which gets it which gets explained in this issue this uh next page is the artisan looking back into his own reflection you know something we know from the end of the first series that he really is not a fan of his own body he as someone who likes design he likes engineering he did not have a say in what he looked like the forgers designed him so he he hates it you know but that's that's what he is and i wanted this sense of scale of him walking over his old cape of how big he used to be and the power he used to have we return to the resolve and the lurk and the resolve is basically um installing really high-tech weaponry inside herself stuff that's we we'll see more of that in the series of, of there's a bit of a flashback coming up of her initially getting interested in weapons and i like this notion that she like her interest is always constantly adjusting her body and putting in more and more weaponry and testing things out i like that there was kind of a fun violent nature to that and then this moment with the lurk where he the result really does not want him to go off but she knows how much it means to him so he goes off and then the end of the issue here which some major stuff happens uh this is a transmission from the forgers and i wanted it to also be cross-cut with the wraith returning back to the triumvirate so things are hopefully building here uh i liked that legion zenith really does care about the wraith you know he cares about all the soldiers in his army that for as dangerous and kind of brutal as legion zenith is that his soldiers mean something to him this line here where the wraith says you know the legion darkened now in both action and hue and he touches legion zenith's chest that's explaining why the, the current legion is gray and the wraith is colored still like blue and silvers because the notion is that when your legion suffers or has been you know strained to the point that it has been they're emotionally sort of graying a little bit and going a little dark literally so the idea that the wraith has been cut off from them and not part of them for a while he still maintains his color but the legion itself is more gray that there's been much fighting and then there'll be kind of a further hint of what caused this in the future but i, I wanted that contrast of you know why do they look so gray it was an idea i had visually with the wraith in the first series that doesn't really get shown but i liked that even though he's metal it's so almost sort of like a crustacean idea or like coral that emotionally not not flashing red or whatever when he's angry but like there'd be subtle changes to his armor coloring depending on what he was feeling so 
I wanted this this exchange here, this quick little shot where Legion, Envoy, and Viscount look at the Wraith. And they just kind of give him this silent look and they say nothing. And this is the big reveal of what's what's happened where the Triumvirate and the Wraith know what, what's gone down. And the Artisan comes out. And this was an important scene, scene for me a lot because I wanted the Wraith to return with some some real teeth. You know, I wanted it to be that you know, he warned the artisan in the first series, and now he blinds the artisan. Basically, he shows the artisan this fire. The artisan is not meant to see. It's this type of fire, clarion fire, which is also mentioned in the first series. It's a fire that the wraiths can kind of use, and it's just not meant for his eyes to see, so his eye explodes. And it was important to me that the wraith, you know, for as heartwarming as the kid is with the wraith, and the wraith is toward the kid, that the wraith really is a dangerous character, as is his whole army. And so if you cross him, as the artisan certainly did, you know, you, you get what you deserve. And so I wanted the artisan to really be brought to his knees in this issue as the transmission continues from the Forgers. And I wanted the Forgers to still maintain an element of mystery that just because you've reached the home world, you still don't see them. And you, instead you see kind of the result of their work that like yet another awful thing related to the Forgers has been unleashed. And I wanted this final sequence of basically all the, or a lot of the characters looking out to this symbol which has been established from the first two series and this final splash page which is a Raytheus symbol a massive Raytheus symbol burning on the planet and the reveal that that is actually the face of a character so that's why the Wraith hates it so much from the first series that it's not just a bit of graffiti you know it really relates to something and we will get into that in the next issue majorly uh, next issue's cover is the character so I don't want to spoil it too much, but that that is a major uh, new character who will be arriving. Uh, the extras here in this issue, uh, it's a return of the psychological profiles from the first series. So Dr. Drea Letamendi returns here to analyze the resolve and the lurk. Some really interesting stuff because I, I understood or I had some idea of this idea of like codependency of two characters that essentially have their own lives defined by each other. And I'm not a psychologist or have any mental health experience aside from my own life, but I'm friends with a lot of psychologists and certainly Dr. Dre has been very helpful about understanding this stuff. But I was really curious that, like what her analysis would be of it because when I'm writing these characters, I generally am just trying to write them as characters. And then when she does these profiles, it's really cool for me to kind of learn like why they're acting a certain way because I really try and write them just as how I feel they would act in a certain scene. I don't really put the psychological meaning behind it because I don't have that education so I just kind of write what feels natural to them and then Dr. Dre always has a really cool analysis of it that feels very authentic to me where she'll explain things where I'm like oh yeah that, that does feel like why I put that in there like that really was what I was thinking even if I didn't know the actual terminology this uh, pin up on the next page is by my friend Jared Hickman who's a great artist he's depicting sort of a call back to the first series of the Wraith and the two scared kids Jared's a really really cool artist he has a really stylized like interesting i mean his instagram's great you should check it out he does like really cool likenesses of actors and characters in his style that are instantly recognizable but just some really great art i'm glad to have him included here and that's it for issue five i will see you next time for the giant finale so thank you again for listening <laughs>